started here with the April 6, 2023 Historic Landmark Commission meeting. Uh, our fearless leader and chair, Babs DeLay, is excused tonight, so I will be running the meeting as the vice chair. Um, as far as attendance goes, we have Kenton Peters, Mike Vila, Michael Abramson, Amanda DeLuca, uh, Emily Kearns, and myself, John Iwanowski. Um So we have a quorum. We are going to start with the approval of the minutes from our uh, March 2nd, 2023 meeting. If I could get a motion. A motion that we approve the meetings from the last meeting. Okay, Mike, motion for approval. Um, I'll second. And Michael seconded the motion. Uh, let's just go one by one on voting for the minutes. Kenton? Abstain. Mike? Aye. Michael? Aye. Amanda? Aye. Emily? Aye. And I am a yes as well. So the minutes passed. Um, next, we have report of the chair and vice chair. I do have a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say that the um, registration for the Utah Preservation Conference is currently open. That's put on jointly by the State Historic Preservation Office and Preservation Utah. Uh, this year it's on June 9th, which I think is a Friday, at um, the Columbus School in South Salt Lake. And I think registration is only like 10 or $15. So it's a good deal. If you're an architect, you can get a lot of CEUs um, and just learn about kind of what, what's going on in the preservation world statewide. Um, and the second announcement is um, where the preservation conference was last year, the historic 15th Ward Chapel um, was listed on the National Register last week. So just kind of a congrats to them. That is currently the Art Castle at 9th West and 1st South in um, Poplar Grove. And it's currently owned by the Utah Arts Alliance. They're a good steward of the building and they're doing great work out there. Um, report of the director. You actually made all the announcements <laughs> that I had thought of. So I uh, thought you were going to say that. So yeah, I, I said it first. nothing to add. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Um, so that moves us into the agenda for this evening. First off, we have an extension request for new construction and special exceptions at approximately 738 South Green Street. Um, I don't believe that there's any discussion to be had here, and it's not a public hearing. So um, unless anyone has any questions for Sarah or the applicant, um, I would entertain a motion. Oh, I was just going to make a motion. Do you have uh, something to? No. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, Kenton moves to approve. I can second that. And Mike seconds it. Um, so let's do a vote starting with Kenton. Aye. Mike. Aye. Michael. Aye. <laughs> Amanda. Aye. Emily. And I am an aye as well. So the motion passes unanimously six Six eyes, zero nays. Uh, moving along to general public comments, we will hear public comments not pertaining to items listed on the agenda. And I have one comment card um, from Cindy Cromer. My um, most recent comment to you had to do with a building on the southeast corner of 600 South and um, 600 East and 300 South. And I'm going to circle back to the issue of what makes a building contributory, but I feel some urgency in asking you to clarify your expectations for the materials submitted 
for projects in districts in terms of their impact on the streetscape and especially on nearby contributory buildings. Here's an example from a recent planning commission meeting, not, out, not in a historic district, and I'm choosing the planning commission so you know I'm an equal opportunity critic. The Planning Commission was asked to approve 80 additional linear feet on Denver Street, that's an interior block street, in the transit corridor on 400 South. The east side of Denver Street already has a building that's too big on it. Um, there were no renderings to show what the completed street would look like, although one could guess that it would receive sunlight for only brief portions of the day and approximate a man-made canyon. The Commission proceeded to grant the additional length. I'm asking you to provide instructions to the planning staff about your expectations. You have received comprehensive drawings for single-family infill. At times, the schematics for large projects have also been superb. An example was the Masonic Temple Apartments, now known as the Regis. But at times, the images have been absent, as they were with Station 424 and Trolley North in the Central City District. The streetscape is important, and the interface with surviving contributory structures is important. The inconsistency of images submitted suggests to me that the application process is not controlling what is submitted. The variation suggests to me that the planners are not waving some applicants through and holding others to a higher standard. What I think is happening is that there is inadequate specificity regarding the plan submitted, and I'm asking you to look at opportunities to fill that gap. There are no guarantees that what the applicant presents will be what we perceive at the end of construction. But I can assure you that in many current situations, such as the one with the Planning Commission recently, we don't have adequate information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Are there any other public comments? Anyone else wishing to speak at this time? Okay, great. Um, moving on to our public hearings for the evening, we have two of them, starting with the Fisher Mansion Carriage House HVAC at approximately 1206 West, 200 South. And I am going to recuse myself from this hearing um, due to some past work on the project. And Mike is going to take over as the chair. You can do that. All right. First, we will hear from staff. All right, so uh, a good portion of this presentation will be a repeat for many of you except for Kenton. <laughs> so welcome to the, Fair the Fisher Mansion Carriage House major modification. This is a request by Parks and Public Lands for a major alteration to the Fisher Mansion Carriage House located at 1206 West 2nd South. The request includes a retroactive approval for the installation of HV eight HVAC units, conduit, and the associated cages. In order to address the visual impact of the installed units, the applicant is proposing to install <clears throat> two six-foot-tall vegetative screens. Staff is recommending approval of the requested major alteration. As a brief reminder, the commission approved the adaptive reuse of the carriage house in September of 2020. The plan set provided to planning indicated two condenser pads to the north. The alterations to the north elevation primarily included minor masonry repairs and storm windows. No alterations, no additional alterations were proposed um, and no additional information was provided. Uh, this is the north elevation um, as shown on the screen, which was approved by the Landmark Commission. So what was installed we have eight HVAC units, as you can see in the photograph. The conduit line uh, runs up the elevation, and additionally, to secure the units and the conduit, uh, the engineering division installed the steel cages and the conduit covers. In response to last month's discussion, the applicant is proposing a vegetative screen to mitigate the impact of the installed units. 
Staff is also recommending that the applicant paint the uh, conduit to help with the visual impact. The proposal is illustrated on the screen. The applicant is proposing to install um, or to plant hops as the vegetation for this screening. As discussed in the staff report um, and last month, staff often works with property owners and applicants on appropriate location and installation of mechanical equipment. Had the applicant contacted staff, staff would have worked on a reduction of the units, appropriate siting, and reduction of the conduit lines. With that said, staff does find that the proposed visual mitigation is appropriate. And in summary, we are recommending approval of this screening. I can answer any questions at this time, um, if there's any for staff, or I can just call the applicant up to discuss the proposal as well. You want commissioners, any, any questions? Okay. okay. Thank you. Next, uh, invite the applicant to make their presentation. So I'm not sure what was sent. <laughs> Sean was kind enough to send it, so. Do you want me to pull the staff report up? Um, if you could pull up the stuff that we had sent showing what the um, current condition is for the. <coughs> Yeah, so in this one, when it was discussed. I'm sorry, could, could you speak into the microphone, please? Hey, can we get the applicant representatives to um, introduce themselves? Uh, Ken Whedon with CRSA, the architects on the project. Sean Fife, city architect with engineering. So in this one, this was part of the exhibit that I had provided, and it was to show all of the views, what you're seeing from that particular point of view, um, not only just the straight on, but what is impact east, west, and also north. And as you can see, the, the, when, you, when you look at them, there is a, a visual impact on there. So in order to mitigate this whole thing, it was suggested by uh, Salt Lake City Engineering to meet with planning, and we all got together, and the result is what you're seeing on the screen as the proposed solution to this. And um, the reason we did it that way is that we just wanted to get all eyes on it instead of us keep coming back here and suggesting something and going down that pike, it was decided let's just get together and, and come to a resolution for that, um, that problem that we find ourselves in. Okay. Okay. No, I, I think, I think you know, it was a collaborative effort, yeah. and what you're seeing on the screen, it was all parties involved. It, and I should say, public lands also supports, obviously, this option, and they regret they couldn't be here tonight, so I'm trying to represent both <laughs> their department and our division. So. But just to be clear, the, the vegetative screen that, that you're proposing, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a greenish wall, and then there's planting that, that's, that's to grow onto that wall? That, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So there's two proposals of the type of screen. It depends on how the costs come in for, for it. But basically, it's, you have poles, you have a screen, and the, and the hops grow up the screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that we discussed was that what is it going to be in summer and what is it going to be in winter? And we've, we've represented that in the report, basically turn the leaves around because they can die on the vine. And they don't die back. Um, and there is the maintenance that somebody will uh, need to come and cut those at some point uh, so they can grow back. But they grow, uh, they establish themselves pretty thoroughly. If we allowed them, we could have it 25 feet tall, which I don't think is quite desired because that really would obscure it. And there was no intent of actually harvesting the hops. Okay. 
And I'm assuming that, that the height of the, the screen was to match the existing um, uh, rod iron that, that's flanking the path. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was mostly what is the, the high cage that is obscuring that contained the condensing unit, and that's at six feet. That's where that came from. So we're just above that six foot of fence, plus the concrete will be out a couple of inches, you know, for the post. Okay. Commissioners, any, any other questions for the applicant? Uh, I'm wondering about the distance from the building. Um, what's, what's deciding the distance from the building? So part of that is that there's swing gates in front of the cages that open up. So you have to have enough room for that gate to open and some, a maintenance person to be there. So if they have to do a, a condenser replacement, they have room to, to mitigate that and be able to repair that on site. It does not touch the building. It, it comes up to the building, but just like the cages and the condensing units, the only thing that really touches the building are the uh, conduit lines and the covers. We go. Commissioners, yeah. go ahead, Amanda. Is it my understanding that it's going to take one to two years for the hops to reach maturity? This particular hops, you know, it depends on obviously the the water year that we're in. It could establish itself in one year. This particular hops, full height, if you let it grow, can grow up to 25 feet in one season. That's a lot of hops. Um, and in drought conditions? which I'm assuming we're going to be seeing a lot of. So it might be, you know, still upwards of about 12 feet. It could. Uh, that's why we limited it to six feet, because there's no reason to have that. Okay. My concern would be that that dies and nothing is substituted, so you don't have a screen as originally proposed. Well, it, it self-propagates. So this is why we picked hops. Actually, it was a suggestion by uh, Kelsey to, to provide hops. It was a great so, suggestion. I mean, you know, we thought it was great because, you know, Fisher Brewery, it, it works with it, so it's in keeping with it. Um, and so, no, it, uh, it grows back. And so the, the vine dies, but it doesn't die back, and it stays in place. And if you want the hops to propagate, then you just cut those and they grow back. And then the maintenance is, who's in charge of that maintenance? That would be Parks and Rec. Uh, yeah, Public Lands. And, and that would be to built into a regular... Yep. Yeah, and we have irrigation on site also. So. Thank you. Yeah. So in just kind of, we uh, offered an all, uh, all season green vine, uh, but the ones that we found, they are uh, quite invasive or can be quite invasive, and that creates a, uh, an environment where you have a lot more maintenance where you have to keep cutting it back so it doesn't grow over everything. Uh, and most of the other vines that we looked at uh, die back, so you would have no screening in the winter. Um, I just want to say thanks for providing the, the seasonal renderings. I think that's really helpful. I mean, it's a simple thing, but it, it really does help us understand how it's going to look. Uh, question, please. It looks like your opening is... What did it say in the plan? Seven, seven feet. feet? This is seven, seven feet. How did you select that spacing? It seems a little so, bit wide if you're trying to screen. So part of that was just to match the edges of the cages. That's the distance between the two cages that are there, uh, that are on either side of the door. I mean, we, it could be pulled in if, if that's a concern. The door itself is 48 inches. It's a 48 inch wide door. And the view that's up on the screen now, will the public be seeing that angle on the back of the building? So if we go back to the, the four I'm, pictures. I'm just wondering about the, the angles the public will see from, and a seven-foot wide opening gives a pretty wide range of view of the things you're trying to screen. So if you look at the bottom left corner on there, that screen will come out. In fact, we have a view of that where the screen comes out. Uh, I think we provided that with you. So you can kind of see, uh, you know, it's, the, it's that one right there. So you can see how far the screen comes out. So in order to see that seven foot, you would have to go there, stand by the Dominion fence and turn 90 degrees and actually look okay, down that Okay, okay. So it really isn't an issue of visibility through that? No. Okay. No. Thank you. Really. Anything else, commissioners? Very good. Thank you.
Okay. I think uh, next we'll uh, open this up to the public for any kind of comments that we have from, from the public. And uh, Cindy? At your previous hearing, you could have had or heard a blame game, and I'm grateful that it was not. At this point, I think it would be useful to look at ways to avoid something similar happening in the future to any historic building, but especially to one owned by the public. And that is because this solution is marginally adequate and would not have been good enough at the outset. We could blame the pandemic and then rest assured that the problem wouldn't recur for a while if the pandemic ever ends. We could recall the Board of Adjustment case, which I witnessed, in which the structure was built in the wrong place because the wrong person was on the meaningful end of the tape measure. I don't know how a permit for five of something morphs into eight. But I want to go to a conceptual level. This problem occurred because we put too much emphasis on the front of a building and fail to treat all sides with respect. I consider this focus on the front to be a comprehensive shortcoming of our approach to preservation. For me, whatever I can see from the garden is important. Secondly, and again at a conceptual level, this problem occurred because too much emphasis was placed on the interior of the building at the expense of the exterior. The city regulates modifications to the exterior and only deals with the interior in terms of code compliance. Someone flipped those relationships in this case at the expense of the exterior. As I fumed from the audience at the previous hearing, I, I thought, the people in this building will be accustomed to working outdoors. They could put on a sweater or add a fan. It wasn't necessary to compromise the rear facade, but that's where the conceptual area took us. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Are there any other public comments? Uh, hearing none, then I will uh, close the public comment uh, discussion portion and uh, allow the applicant to, to have any response to what was just said, if any. Yes, please. So in response to, to Cindy's concern on that, uh, there was a failure on our part, and we fully admit that, and, and we put that forth. And it came to light when the cages, we, we, when we were seeking approval for the cages. And um, since, you know, there's no excuse, because it came out of, all of it came out of our company, but uh, the, the history of that is that we didn't know that it hadn't been, the full extent of the condenser units had been presented. And that was, that was part of the failure in the program uh, on that part of it. But it did come to light when we did present the cages and that's why we're sitting here today, is because then that came and was revealed. Um, uh, that part of it, we've learned our lesson, and uh, anytime we, we deal with this again, we'll make sure that we contact planning for uh, mitigation of how to place the condensing units. Very well. All right, I think it's uh, time now to close the uh, public discussion um, and now it's it's time for us as commissioners to discuss this. So let's just go in order. Amanda, do you have any comments? I don't have any further com. Uh, yes, I do have comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate Cindy's uh, uh, focus on uh, where the system, if I will, the, there was a failure in the system and the process. Um, and so I hope that moving forward, we can remember that the exterior is the, is the quintessential part of the historic preservation. Um, I am, I'm glad to know that the hops vines are as sturdy as that they've been described. Um, I do have the concern of them getting really and unwild uh, and, and, and unruly. Um, however, if it's built into the regular um, maintenance of the, of the property, then it seems that it won't become an eyesore on top of the um, eight um, units that are on the back of the, of the, the side of the building there. So um, I do like this. If, if there has to be a, a compromise, 
I can live with this. Very nice. Emily, any comments? I've appreciated the spicy and productive uh, conversation about this. Um, I think we can all agree that it is an embarrassing amount of HVAC and an eyesore. Uh, I think that it's good that we move forward on this and put it to bed. Nothing. I think well. it's a, a cute solution. I like the hops. Michael, any comments? Uh, not really. It's tolerable. Yeah, Very the good. solution's tolerable. Mm, not to leave you out, Kenton. Uh, agree with the others uh, and the acknowledgement from the architect of better HVAC solution in the first place would have been preferable, mm -hmm. but it's not there. So what can you do? I think this is the uh, an acceptable compromise. Okay, very good. And I think, Kenton, uh, I, my only comment is I, I brought up the same notion when I was looking at the plans and seeing a seven-foot opening, it seemed a little arbitrary. I don't know what's coming in and out of that, that back door that would require a seven-feet opening. But I'm, uh, since, quite frankly, since staff's recommendation was, was to approve this, I'm, I'm going to leave that alone. Um, but now I'll look to my commissioners for a motion. Uh, I can move. I'll, I have the motion sheet available here. Uh, based on the information presented in discussion, I move that the commission approve this application with the following findings. Um, motion to approve with conditions implemented or modified by the, we, we don't have any of that, do we? Sorry, this is a confusing um, motion sheet. Sorry, I, I wasn't. Here, do you need this? Here you go. I'd have been done in a rush. <laughs> Let's see what we got. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Abramson, you could just end that motion at the application and cut off with the following findings. Okay. Uh, based on the information presented in discussion, I move that the commission approve this application. Very good. Uh, there's been a motion. Can we have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Let's uh, go in order, at least in my order that I'm seeing. Uh, Amanda? Aye. Emily? Aye. Michael? Aye. Kenton? Aye. And I think we need uh, one more, and I'm supposed to vote as well. I vote aye as well. So it's, it's five to, to zero. It passes. Thank you. Very good. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, rejoining the meeting, and we have our second public hearing of the evening. Uh, second story window at approximately 319 East 4th Avenue. Um, and Megan Booth is the planner. Yes, hi, I'm Megan Booth. I'm a principal planner in the planning division. This is my first time at HLC, so nice to meet you all. So as summarized, the applicant is David Richardson, the property owner is Spencer Taylor and Alyssa Ransbury. The location is 319 East 4th Avenue in the SR1 zoning district. This is in the Avenues master plan area. Also, it is in the Avenues local and national historic district. Um, staff's recommendation on this is to approve the new window on the west facade of the house on the second floor. Um, the reason why this is before you is because this window would be visible from the street, and so it requires approval by the Historic Landmark Commission per the Avenue's master plan. So here is a vicinity and zoning map. You can see where the project is located. Here are some site photos just explaining what I said a few minutes ago, that this would be visible from the street. Um, it is next to an apartment complex and another single-family home. Some additional information for the request is this window is needed for egress and ingress to allow the room to be habitable per building code. As you can see on the uh, floor plan, they have the demolition plan to go ahead and open 
the wall. And then right now it's um, labeled as storage. But the only reason why it is is because it needs a window in order, order to be habitable. So the key considerations for this request is, number one, the location of the new window, um, the design and the material of the replacement window, and the compliance with the Avenue's master plan. So um, the applicant provided the details for the replacement window. Um, as I mentioned, it's important the design placement and material be appropriate for the historic building. Um, the existing, existing second story window, it's located this one right here in the middle is an arch window with art glass or antique leaded beveling, and the new window sill will match the existing window. It will be a wood window, and the casing and inset will match the other windows on the home. Um, the material or the window will be a Pella Architect Series, traditional wooden clad window, and I provided the drawing below. So our standards re for review are attached and shown in attachment E and F of your staff report. Um, the proposal does comply with the standards of review. So again, as mentioned, we, I am recommending approval of um, the second story window, and that's my recommendation. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Megan. And then does the applicant wish to present? We all know who you are, but if you could please start by stating your name. David Richardson, I'm the uh, project architect. Um, I just want to thank staff for a fabulous report and, uh, and really a nice presentation. I, th I think this sort of speaks for itself. It's, it's typical in, in this post-COVID world that we have people working from home and they need to have a little space. So thank you for your consideration. Do we have any questions for the applicant or for planning staff? I have one question. It's aluminum clad wood? Yeah, it's a Pella Architect series, aluminum clad. What's the finish going to be on that? On the outside? Yeah. I'm not sure they selected a color. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, so it'll be like a Kynar finish or something yeah. like that? Like, mm -hmm. And it'll match the color match of the, the other wood. windows. Okay. Yeah. That was my question. I was also going to ask about the storage, why, why we were putting a window in a storage room. Well, was this was one of the, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the, um, the couple recently had a child, and, and we, to, to push the project forward, we elected to permit it before visiting landmarks for the window. Great. Um, so opening up to public comment, I don't have any comment cards. I don't know if there's anyone wishing to speak on this item. <laughs> okay, well, we'll close the public hearing and go into executive session. Um, commissioners, do we have anything we want to discuss? My question was about the painted brick, not the window. And how that comes into play when something like this is brought before us. So perhaps it's a question for staff. Yeah, I can I can jump into that. The we don't regulate brick that's already been painted. If it's been painted, and some brick requires paint, right? Um, if it's been painted, it can continue to be painted. It's the unpainted masonry that we regulate. Maybe in cases like this, we should require the project architect to go back out and manually chip it off <laughs> carefully. <laughs> Any other comments, discussion? I'm happy with the, the Pella product, and I think that's the appropriate solution here. So, I, I, didn't have a, excuse me, I didn't have a question, just a comment as well. And it's, it's, it's pleasing to see that, that you know, the, the replacement windows was respectful of, of the, the rest of the house. And at the end of the day, it'll look like it, it's a part of the original and that's that's why we're all here is to is to keep that look and feel of, of the district you know as it is and intact so thank you well done there's no more discussion I would entertain a motion 
I, I can make that uh, motion. Um, based on the information presented and the discussion, I propose that the commission uh, approve the request for a certificate of appropriateness for a new window at uh, 319 East 4th Avenue. Second. <coughs> Second the motion. Okay, Mike made the motion and Kenton seconded <coughs> it. Um, let's go down the line. Kenton? Aye. Mike? Aye. Michael? Aye. Amanda? Aye. And Emily? Aye. Great, the motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you. all. And the last item on our agenda tonight is a work session um, to present the Affordable Housing Incentives Text Amendment, which will be done by Sarah. Did you find the Wi-Fi I did, never did. Is there a Wi-Fi password? This file is... And can you move the microphone closer to you, please? So. So th thank you. Tonight, I wanted to go ahead and talk with you about the proposed affordable housing incentives. So first of all, what I wanted to do was talk about the goals and the background of the project, um, the process, and then the proposed incentives and their applicability to historic districts. Um, first, I want to talk about the, how they would apply in the single and two-family zoning districts, and then the residential multifamily or RMF zoning districts, and then also the multifamily and mixed-use zoning districts, and then there'll be some time for discussion. So first of all, the goals of the affordable housing incentives. First of all, they're to implement growing SLC, the current citywide housing plan, and then plan, plan Salt Lake, the citywide master plan. Um, one, one intent of them is to make taxpayer dollars go further. So for projects that already have affordable housing, they may be able to increase the number of affordable units, and then they may also be able to provide units that are affordable to those that have lower AMIs than they would otherwise have been able to. And they also are designed to hopefully have market rate development be able to provide affordable units as well. And they may provide options for property owners to provide new affordable housing units. So first of all, I've already talked a little bit about affordability in relation to AMI or area median income. And so for the incentives, what we're looking at are the 2022 income guidelines from HUD for the Salt Lake City metro area, which includes Salt Lake and Tuella counties. It divides the affordable housing into three different groups. Um, the first would be housing units accommodating those earning up to 30% AMI at extremely low income. And then for very low income, it would be housing units accommodating those um, making more than 30% and up to 50% AMI. And then low income housing units would be for those that earn between 50% and 80% AMI. So if you're looking at the area median income, which would be 102,400, 30% of that for a one person family would be 21,500 for an annual income. So they would have about $538 available for housing each month. And then for a four person family, they would have about 30,700 for the annual income and then $768 per month. And so then you can see how that increases at 50 or 80% AMI. So just kind of taking a step back and looking at Salt Lake City and first of all, where multifamily housing is permitted, um, have where we are in the city and county building highlighted. And you can see the zoning districts that allow multifamily housing um, around the, the downtown area and then extending along corridors, including Third West, um, Redwood Road, and then there are concentrations in Sugar House as well. Oops. And then when you 
look at uh, single and two family housing. Um, those are generally surrounding the areas where multifamily housing is permitted. You can see it on both um, the east and west of I-15. of I There is no um, housing permitted or single family housing permitted to the west of I-215. And then when you add all of these together, you can see that housing is permitted on um, just a little less than 20% of the land area in the city. And there is quite, a lar quite large areas where housing is not permitted, like City Creek Canyon or by the airport and into the Northwest Quadrant. So it is somewhat limited within Salt Lake. As far as the Affordable Housing Incentives Project, um, the process started in um, late 19, early 2020 with a survey to the community um, put together a framework for the proposal and went back out to the community with another survey. And then in 2020 and 2021, worked to develop an internal draft. Then went out to the public last year with a public draft in January, had outreach during the spring, and then held a planning commission hearing in May of last year. We received quite a bit of feedback from the planning commission and the community. And so in the summer and fall of last year, um, did additional research on options and worked with developers to test the feasibility of the incentives. The mayor's office convened a focus group, and so we worked with the group to um, develop additional modifications and then refined those and made um, additional recommendations and put the, out a new draft in March. We held a couple briefings with the Planning Commission last month, and then another hearing is scheduled with the Planning Commission for later this month. And then I also wanted to note that when we started the project, we did call it an overlay, but as we put together the different proposals and incentives, um, it wouldn't be applied in the way that a traditional over would be, overlay would be applied, like the historic overlay. So we changed the name to be called incentives instead. And so it's in a new incentives chapter in the zoning ordinance. As I mentioned, there was a focus group that was put together, and so I wanted to highlight just briefly the recommendations from the focus group. The first was to remove the proximity to transit and arterial road requirements. They also made a recommendation to incentivize preserving existing housing. They wanted to add additional design standards for the single and two family zoning districts. And we also wanted to add additional incentive options for deeply affordable and larger units. And then they made some recommendations for future zoning and subdivision text amendments. So for historic preservation, and as it relates to you as a commission and the affordable housing incentives, I wanted to talk about how they would apply. Um, so first of all, they would apply to zoning districts that per permit residential development, which is a significant amount of the housing or the um, properties within historic districts. And so they would apply to properties that are in the city's local historic districts and also the city's local landmark sites. Um, there are no modifications proposed to the city's historic regulations or processes. And so any proposal that is proposed as part of the incentives would need to meet the existing um, standards in the zoning ordinance related to historic preservation and also the existing guidelines. Do you want to note that properties that are in National Register historic districts are individually listed on the National Register but are not in local historic districts are not subject to the city's historic regulations, so those regulations wouldn't apply to them. Um, as far as adding units in, some, in historic districts, this could be done with additions, or if there's vacant land or open land, it could be done with new construction. Um, just to kind of give you a refresher, here's where the local historic districts are in the community. I tried to put sites on there and it just became a little overwhelming. So we have the, the districts on there instead. Um, now I wanna go ahead and talk about the proposed incentives themselves. So for the single and two family zoning districts, these are the R1, the FR, the R2, and SR zoning districts. We're proposing to permit additional housing types. And so that would include two family or twin homes, triplexes, fourplexes, sideways and row houses, and groups of three to four, and cottage developments. And so with the original proposal, half of these units would need to be affordable to those earning up to 80% AMI. And so we have a number of changes proposed from last year, but that stays the same for these. As I mentioned before, one of the recommendations from the focus group was for an incentive to preserve existing housing. And so one of the, this would be done by allowing a second detached dwelling on the property. And if this was added, there would be a lower affordability requirement from 50% of the units to one of the units. 
If a property owner chose to do this, they would need to meet the existing height and lot coverage requirements for the zoning district. The existing setbacks and yards would also apply to the perimeter of the development itself rather than between the two units. And um, so again, as the Historic Landmark Commission and for historic properties, you do have the ability to make some modifications to these requirements. So as far as where this would be applicable, it would apply in all single and two family zoning districts. Um, we did remove a previous proximity to transit and our Taylor Road requirement, and we did that due to the frequency of the non-fixed route um, transit route changes. So during COVID, a lot of the bus routes changed either their actual route or their frequency. And so it was just, we realized that that was not the best way to incentivize it. And by removing it, we're also increasing the equitable distribution of the housing types across the city. So as I mentioned briefly, but wanted to just go over in a little bit more detail, um, there would be no increase in height permitted from that base zoning district. There would not be an increase in building coverage permitted. The same or increased yards or setbacks would be required for the perimeter of the property. The minimum lot width would not apply. And then also one off-street parking space would be required per unit. Wanted to go ahead and give one example of having that additional unit um, as a detached dwelling. So this is a historic example um, from, a, from the avenues. And so you can see here there's um, that orange circle that has um, four lots within it. And so you can see with both of those um, properties that front 6th Avenue, there's a, a second detached dwelling to the rear. And so the one on the left has an existing um, duplex, and then there's another property to the rear, and this is actually the best photo that we had of it, but it shows that this does, it has occurred historically. Um, it has occurred in the avenues, also in Capitol Hill, and likely elsewhere in the city. Um, and so if someone wanted to do this today, they would need to meet the base zoning requirements as far as building coverage and height. Um, one parking space would be required per unit, and they would also need to meet those perimeter setbacks. So it would likely look a little bit different than this does. Um, additionally, the focus group recommended some increase in design standards. There were some existing requirements for street-facing facades, and they recommended some additional ones as far as having durable building materials, and that would include the fiber cement board that's shown here, or brick. Um, we also clarified where the building entrance would be located, and added some additional requirements for open space. And again, for historic properties, there are already the existing residential design guidelines, so those would apply to these as well. Moving on to the residential multifamily or RMF zones. The city has four RMF zoning districts, RMF 30, RMF 35, RMF 45, and RMF 75. And so that's reflective of how tall the buildings can be in these districts, 30, 35 feet, and so forth. There are a number of properties in the Capitol Hill, Avenues, Central City, and University Historic Districts that are in RMF zoning districts. And so in these zoning districts, we would not permit additional height or building coverage. The minimum lot width requirement would not apply. The yards would apply to the perimeter of the development. As far as parking, um, one space would be required per unit for up to 10 units and then more than 10 units would follow the park requirements in the parking chapter when there are some special, um, special allowances for affordable housing in that parking chapter. There are design standards, both for row houses and sideways row houses, and then some additional design standards when there are more than two units. For properties, um, property owners to use the incentives, they must meet the affordability requirements. And so for the RMF zones, um, that we would remove the density limits. So the RMF zone has have these qualifying provisions for density, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. And so we would remove those if affordable housing was provided that met the requirements um, for rental housing with those first three bullets, or for for sale housing, where in half of the units were affordable to those earning um, at or below 80% AMI. And then for these RMF zoning RMF zoning districts, no more than 25% of the units could be less than 500 square feet. So an example I wanted to go over for the RMF 35 zoning district um, in, is in the Central City Historic District. It's a duplex that I um, actually reviewed and took to the commission last year. It's located on 700 East between 1st and 2nd South. Um, so the prop this property is 80. Um, 250 square feet 
Um, there was previously a, a building on the site that was destroyed by fire in 2007. And so as I mentioned before, for the RMF zoning districts, there are qualifying provisions for density. So you need a minimum of 8,000 square feet for a duplex, and then you need a minimum of 9,000 square feet for three units, and then an additional 3,000 square feet, which does change as the um, site gets larger for a multifamily building. So in this particular case, you needed to have um, a minimum of 8,000 square feet for the duplex, and then the property would also need to be a minimum of 50 square feet for that duplex, and so they had to have a lot line adjustment to get that extra six inches of lot width so that they could put the duplex on the property. And so with this, we would remove the density requirements for the property, and then the limitations would basically be based on the, the building coverage and parking and height. And so one thing that happens when you have these, um, these density limitations is you end up with somewhat large buildings. You have a building here with, that has a 3,300 square foot footprint um, for two units. There's a, a one unit in front and one unit in back. And so you end up having quite large units. And so if you, have, if you remove those density requirements, there would likely be the ability to have um, smaller units and more units on the site. Oops. So moving on to the multifamily and mixed use zoning districts, the goal here is to allow for additional affordable units in districts that permit um, the multifamily and mixed use buildings. Um, this would be done in a few different ways. The first is additional height by right or with administrative design review, and then allowing for additional housing types in some commercial zones and also in the institutional zone. And then we'd also require affordable units for an additional one or two stories in the transit station area zones rather than um, being able to add an additional story per um, a requirement with an administrative review point score that we have right now. So one example of um, a building in a TSA zone is station 424 and Central City Historic District. And so, um, as I mentioned, in these TSA zoning districts, projects that have a development score that qualifies for administrative review are eligible, eligible for an, ad, an increase in height that's limited to one story. And so in the incentives pro projects that were in a core district would be able to have up to two stories. And then projects that are in transition zones would be able to have one story. And so, Again, with um, projects that are in historic districts, the proposal would need to be compatible with the district and meet the standards and the guidelines for that district, but it would be an option. Um, to have this extra story, the proposal would need to meet the affordability requirements for that extra story. And so, for example, Station 424 did choose to have that extra story, and if the incentives were in place, they would need to provide affordable units for that extra height, but they could have up to two additional stories. So for these um, mixed use and multifamily zoning districts, there are seven different incentive options. Um, the first are three that were presented last May. And so they required 20% um, of the units as affordable to 80% AMI. And then there were two options that required 10% of the units as affordable. And one was at a lower AMI of 60, and then the other was for larger units, but at 80% AMI. And the feedback that we heard from the community was for um, a greater percentage of units and also to target the units towards more deeply affordable um, units at a lower AMI. And so we worked with developers to, um, to see how if we could do this and what kind of percentage of units we could require as affordable and um, what affordability level we could go to. And if we increase the percentage of affordable units, um, it wouldn't be feasible for the developer. And so we've provided some additional options that have a lower percentage of the units as affordable, but are targeting lower AMIs with them too. So the, um, the desired outcome for, for the proposal is that market rate developers could include affordable units in projects and wouldn't have a negative um, effect on their returns. And then if you have an existing affordable project, they could construct more units. And so we've achieved this by adding some additional incentive options for more deeply affordable units and for larger units. With the proposal last May, we also received a number of comments on the reporting and enforcement aspects of it. So we have added some additional reporting requirements to the proposal. We've clarified the enforcement penalties 
Um, we've increased the fines that could apply, and also noncompliance um, at a certain point can result in a lien being placed on the property for the fines, and then the business license related to the property can also be revoked. There are some additional changes from last May's proposal. Um, one of them is to ensure consistency with the Downtown Building Heights text amendment, um, which has, at the Weeding for City Council action, also made some modifications to the landscaping requirements in commercial districts and allowing those to be um, at above grade. And then we've made some additional housekeeping and other clarifying changes. And so that is what I wanted to talk about with the commission. Um, again, our next steps are that there's a planning commission hearing later this month. And then once the planning commission makes a recommendation, it will be transmitted to the city council and then the city council has the um, final decision-making authority on it. And so I um, wanted to open it up for questions and comments. Thanks, Sarah. Um, who's got questions? I'll bet most of us do, but. I, I've, got, I've got a few questions. Um, in looking at, at the examples that you had, most of these were on the side or to the back. Of, of an existing uh, unit, uh, there's there's neighborhoods or there are neighborhoods here and there's houses here that are, that the house is built towards the back of, of the the lot and they may be deep lots. Mm -hmm. Would this allow for for a new construction in front of a house? I think that in a historic district that may be more difficult because I think you'd want to look at the compatibility of that new unit and how it fit in with the streetscape okay. and so, what the so impact then it, of that yeah, was. I, so then I was supposing, you know, when, when I asked the question, then I was supposing then that a new house would, would have to match or, or somewhat be respectful for the two adjacent older historic houses, that that would be a part of the approval process. I think that's something that we'd have to have to consider on a case by case basis, okay. especially in the historic districts. I'm, I'm curious why the, the uh, transit uh, proximity was relaxed with, with this. Did I understand that correct? Right. So originally there was a requirement that it would apply for those single and two family zones when it was within a quarter mile of um, high frequency transit, which included bus routes and then adjacent to an arterial roadway. And it would, over the course of the past couple of years, those routes have changed frequently, like the actual routes themselves, and then also the frequency, they became not as high frequency, so they wouldn't have met those requirements. And so it was kind of, it was determined that that would not be the best way to regulate the incentive. And then there were questions of equity that came up and having the incentives apply more equally um, across the community and across those zoning districts. So, so we've removed that requirement. Okay. I can jump in to address the, like if there's a large front yard and the house is set back and there's potentially room to build another structure. If that home was contributing, I, th I think that would be pretty burdensome to, right? Because you would be covering the, the front elevation and the principal structure. Okay. Um, we would probably encourage like a rear addition or, or some sort of alternative solution to adding units to the property in that case. And then um, I, I guess the last question, I got a couple of others, but I'm gonna leave some time for others. The, the, the parking of, of one parking per unit up to 10 units, that seems, uh, uh, I'm going to choose my word wisely. It that's just not enough. I, I mean, if you have ten units and you, it it seems like there would be more more than one per unit, one point two or one point five or something, because it just feels like, at least to me, that if there are ten units, there's going to be a, a need for twelve, thirteen, fourteen cars, meaning that those additional cars are going to just have to find a, a place on the street someplace, and a lot of these neighborhoods are already taxed uh, with cars on the street. Mm -hmm. I can jump in and adjust that. Hi. Uh. <laughs> I'll just be talking. <laughs> um, I'll jump in and adjust that comment. The, the proposal is a, a minimum of one. If the developer chose or the market proved that they needed additional parking, they could choose to add additional parking. The issue with the city requiring 
more than one in this situation is that that actually increases the cost of the unit and it's less likely they're going to achieve a needed AMI for the development. So that's why it's established at one as the minimum. Okay. More questions for planning staff? Uh, I have a lot of questions. I guess I'm wondering where we stop with this as a historic landmark commission because I feel like some of my questions are unrelated to our purview. Um, specifically, I guess I'm wondering about the relationship between this and LIHTC. Um, is this a supplement to LIHTC or is it like a, could, could a project conceivably get both <laughs> LIHTC and this or is one sure. precluding the other? So the primary incentive with this is to allow a development right that they don't otherwise have to allow additional height or to allow, um, you know, allow that additional unit. And so that's kind of a zoning incentive that we're providing. And so the LIHTC, the Low Income Housing Tax Credits, those are um, a tax credit program that projects um, can choose to use. And so this, you could choose to have um, a LIHTC project use affordable housing incentives. So possibly both in some cases, okay. Correct. Thanks. And the idea, one thing with that too, is if a project had, you know, let's say they had 100 units that they could provide with the existing zoning, and if they could go up an extra floor, then rather than having, let's say, 20% of the units, so you have, if you had 100 units and 20% of them were affordable, if you could go up an extra floor and have another 20 units, then you could have another four or five more affordable units in your project that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to have. Although, it would, let's be realistic, it's unlikely that those units would be on the top floor. <laughs> I mean, like, I, that's the other thing that, that strikes me about this is that the, the numbers are just so small here. Like, 5% of units is not very many units, right? I don't, I mean, again, this is like we're getting outside our purview if we're talking about that, but. So just to address that first comment about the location of the units, we do have a comparable units provision in the proposal. And so the units couldn't all be on the same floor. They'd have to be equally dispersed about in the building. Um, they have to be accessed from the same entrance. They'd have to have access to all the amenities that are in the building. If there were a range of unit types in the building, the affordable units would also need to be in that same range. You couldn't have all you know, studios in a basement or things along those lines. Great, thanks. Okay. So in that, in that vein, um, it, it, you know, it was noted that developers were part of the process, discussions with them. It seems like mixing the affordable units and market rate units would be less appealing to developers because you know you could get this social this stratification or 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 this flattening of stratification which buyers would seem to want what what were the developers responses to these ideas i'm I'm not sure I entirely understand the question so oh, you could, well, uh, let, let me rephrase it okay, okay so you've got someone who has a bit higher income mm -hmm. and they want a place mm -hmm. they might not be as willing to plunk down their money if they're going to be living immediately adjacent to a lower income person so yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to sure. be the devil's advocate coming sure. from the developer's point of view I want to make money on my development mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm gonna rely upon higher income people in order to do that so the incentives would be optional. They're not, it's, it's not an inclusionary proposal where um, affordable units are required. And so it would be something that a developer could choose to do. The idea being they could have that additional height, they could have that additional density for those okay. units set aside. Okay, that, that makes sense. I, I kind of forgot that voluntary aspect which makes all the difference. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, my question is how this relates to the new ADU um, ordinance. Is there, could you in theory build both an ADU and an affordable detached dwelling? You could. The and could, the, could the ADU be the affordable? 
So in the way we have inter the way we apply ADUs generally is an ADU is not considered a unit of density. So if you have a single family home, you can have an ADU. With this proposal, we would count an ADU towards the four units that you would be permitted on the property. So if you if you did build like a detached single family residence and then an ADU, two of them to meet the 50% requirement, two of them would have to be 80% yes, AMI. Yes, correct. And then if you preserved your existing dwelling, one of them would, ha would need to be 80% AMI, which would most likely be the case if there was one of these in the historic district. Is there an owner occupancy requirement at all with these? Or no. can they both be, they can both be rented? Mm -hmm. Amanda? Can you remind me again uh, how the enforcement of this works in terms of holding folks accountable? Sure. I didn't talk too much about the enforcement aspect. So, uh, so first of all, we would require annual reporting, and we have specific requirements that need, would need to be submitted if a property was to use um, the LIHTC funding or Le Orlean, or Olean Walker funding or another similar funding source, they would be able to complete um, that report and submit that to us. And so that would be, that would require income verification and information on who is living in those units. And so that's kind of that reporting side of things. And so that would be an annual requirement. And then on the enforcement side, um, if a property owner was found not to be renting at that rate that is the affordable rate, um, there could be a $100 fine that's existing um, that could be applied. We'll also have a specific affordable housing incentives fine that would be added to the consolidated fee schedule, and that's updated annually. And then there's an additional fine that would be the difference between the market rate of the unit and the affordable rate. And then those, though, once those um, equal $5,000 or it's been 90 days, a lien can be placed on the property. And this is um, being handled by existing staff, or is that taken into consideration? We do anticipate that there would need to be additional staff. I think it depends on, and we know it depends on, the number of properties that use the incentives. <laughs> Any other questions or comments for planning? Um, this is a work session, so there's no public hearing, but there is opportunity for the public to comment, I believe, on the, on the proposal generally. Correct. There is a project web page, and we do have a comment form on that project web page that people can fill out at any time. And then uh, it is tentatively scheduled for a planning commission hearing on April 26th, and so that would have a public hearing with the opportunity for the public to provide comments then. Uh, this is a lot of stuff. It covers, you know, almost every kind of habitation, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, it is a lot to dissect. And what I had a problem with was the additional bigger buildings for cheaper. Um, I think that uh, I think there's a lot of evidence of harm already being done by giant buildings in in existing neighborhoods uh, and I think it harms harms everyone and the return on this is just too low there are restrictions as far as the building coverage um, that it must meet the existing permitted building coverage and height for zoning districts um, for the RMF zoning districts, and then the single and two-family zoning districts, where the additional height does come in is in those multifamily and mixed-use zoning districts. Just wanted to make sure that's clear. Uh, there's a lot of, I, I do like um, the, the row house and the setback allowances to increase residential density uh, throughout the city. I think that that's got some real potential, but the um, high-density mixed-use buildings, I think they're problematic. I have just one final question. In, in the percentages of 30% for, for very much under and medium under and so, how, how were those percentages derived? What was the discussion point? For the, the, the 30, the 
50 but and the there, 80? There was, as I recall, there was like 30% uh, for very much under uh, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the, you know, what was the discussion and, and how did those numbers get set, I guess? Sure. So just for the, the AMI levels, 80% AMI, um, that kind of that 50 to 80% AMI for low income is a fairly common reference, um, or, or 60, 60, and then um, the very low income at that 30%, those are, kind of, those are done really kind of common references. And then as far as where, where we set these, some of them was looking at those lo low income housing tax credit requirements. They have requirements for 60% um, for AMI and, um, and so that's where, where those come from for, for the percentages. And we were looking at what was feasible as far as the total percentage of units if we wanted to encourage it as an incentive for market rate development. Thank you. And it did include in the attachment some of the information that we had from the developers. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Um, that is the end of our agenda for this evening. Our next regular meeting is scheduled for Thursday, May 4th, 2023. So that's a wrap. Um, this meeting is adjourned. Bye -bye.